Hello, I'm Graham Fitch and I'm bringing you this video demonstration on forearm rotation from Steinway Hall in London and this illustrates my article in issue 86 of Pianist magazine. So let's look a little bit about why we might need forearm rotation. Um, the series of articles that I'm writing at the moment has to do with tension and how to avoid tension and how to deal with tension. So forearm rotation is brilliant for just making us feel more empowered and looser. And if we are injured, it's a fantastic way of uh, rehabilitating the arms and the fingers, the body. So let's just start off a little bit um, history here. When we as pianists sort of evolved from the harpsichord, we had inherited an up-down finger stroke, uh, which was really like this. Little piston fingers here. I'm not using anything other than the finger that I'm lifting. And that's absolutely a part of piano playing. We, we can't play the piano without that movement. But it's not the be-all and end-all. So when pianists discovered in the 19th century that the pianos were evolving, getting bigger, the keyboards were becoming heavier, and the music being written uh, was much more difficult, uh, they couldn't really manage with this. So what they did was they said, OK, let's see if we can exaggerate that and really go for a big swinging finger motion. And that started to injure pianists. So teachers had to come up with alternatives, which meant using the arm to play. And rotation is just an offshoot of the arm, the experiments into the arm. So let me just show you what rotation is and also show you what it isn't. Let me show you what it isn't first. It's not, people talk about wrist rotation. They don't, what that is, that's a completely valid movement as well. It's what I call a circular movement or a sculpted movement. That's not what forearm rotation is. If you consider the forearm from the elbow to the tip of the fingers as one unit, um, the, with rotation, the, the fingers will lift not from here, but from the forearm. So I actually don't have to lift the fingers or do anything um, active with the fingertips at all. I can rotate and use fingers as well, and that's something that we'll, we'll look at in a second. So let's just look a little bit at the, some terminology. Pronation is a movement toward the body. Supination is a movement outwards in this way. Now the thing with the rotation is you'll see it the most clearly in examples with Alberti basses, trills, and tremolos. That's the most obvious, uh, well they are the most obvious examples. So let me just give you a little bit of a um, demonstration from Mozart's Sonata in D, K284, toward the end of the exposition where you'll see a trill and an Alberti bass happening at the same time. I'm sure that was very visible to you. The trill was, because the trill's twice as fast as the Alberti, the movements are twice as fast. But it's very, very easy, kind of an effortless movement to make. Now, the, probably the most famous tremolo in the repertoire is the first movement of the Pathétique Sonata. So it would be perverse to do that any other way than rotary. The way it feels when we play that, the elbow is in one spot. Uh, let me show you in the right hand. I don't think you'll be able to see the left hand. Let me just do that in reverse. So, you see how the elbow remains in one place? And the fifth finger is lifted, but not from the finger, from the arm, similarly with the thumb. So I need to do that very rhythmically. It's not a free-for-all, it's very rhythmical. Um, now, let's just look a little bit at, I'm going to give you an exercise now to develop the rotation. And what I'd like you to do is to stand up and just swing your arm by your side until it's completely free, loose, and when you lift your hand up to the keyboard, you'll notice your natural default hand position. Everything will be beautifully aligned. Um, so that's what I call my natural curved position. 
That is an unnaturally curled up position, scrunched up. We don't want that because that's tense, as would be for most fast playing anyway. Flat fingers are out for that. Wonderful for melodic, slow melody playing, cantabile sound, flat fingers are brilliant, but not for a general default position. So let me show you the exercise and I'll sort of talk over the top. You'd recognize it as Hannon number six, but I'm going to do it in a completely different way from how Hannon says in the book. Now, I hope you'll notice that I'm making a couple of adjustments. As I go, as I need to put my thumb on the keyboard, I make an inward movement toward the back of the, the fallboard here. That's why. Why do I do that? It's because thumb and the pinky are short fingers, two, three, four are long fingers. So if I don't want to, and I, I don't want to, get embroiled in this position uh, between the black and the white keys here, very uncomfortable. So. If I didn't make the adjustment there, I would have to curl my fingers up in order to avoid that. You see what I'm doing there? In, out. And I'm in an out position when my long fingers are involved playing white keys. I do suggest that you transpose this exercise into maybe a couple of different keys. You don't need to do it in all 12, but. Now, I don't know if you can see that. Hopefully you'll be able to see that I, I added one more adjustment, which was an up-down adjustment. Why? Because the black keys, when as soon as I start to use black keys, the black keys are higher up and further away. It looks kind of obvious, isn't it? But up. So up and in and down and out are the main adjustments we need to make. In the, in the second part of this demonstration, I'm going to talk about how we can apply the rotations to scale patterns and things that might not immediately look like they belong to rotation. So do join me again soon.